Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, June 12th, 2022, a day that marks the 40th anniversary of when a million people gathered in Central Park in support of nuclear disarmament. Nearly 100 peace, disarmament, and social justice organizations are co-sponsoring today's event, which is sponsored by the Roots Action Education Fund. My name is Ryan Black, and I will be co-hosting today along with Hanya Jodat. We uh, will hear live presentations from a wide range of speakers today, including Medea Benjamin, Jerry Brown, Leslie Kagan, Mandy Carter, Emma Claire Foley, Pastor Michael McBride, Curry Peterson Smith, David Swanson, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, India Walton, Anne Wright, and others. Director, producer Jeff Daniels will speak and present excerpts from his documentary, television event about the huge impacts of the 1983 TV film, The Day After. We will also see the world premiere of a video featuring Daniel Ellsberg on diffusing the threat of nuclear war, produced by Oscar nominated director, Judith Elric. We hope that you will stick around for as much of today's program as you can, and we hope that this event will serve as a catalyst for future grassroots organizing. We'll also, also ask you to please share our website, diffusenuclearwar.org, on social media, and urge your friends and uh, followers to join us here today. With that, we'll get started. All right. Thank you, Hanya. In 1983, Mandy Carter was on staff at the War Resisters League Southeast office in Durham, North Carolina. They did a 300-mile women's peace walk to join the Seneca Women's Peace Encampment in Romulus, New York. They occupied a site near the Seneca Army Depot to protest the deployment of nuclear weapons to Europe. The Seneca Women's Peace Encampment for a Future of Peace and Justice originated from the Global Feminism and Disarmament held on June 11, 1982 in New York City, one day before the historic June 12, 1982 march and rally for uh, nuclear disarmament. Mandy Carter. I bring you greetings from Durham, North Carolina. So glad to be a part of today. I just got done watching the previous program on the June 12th, 12th the Legacy Project. Um, WRL, War Resisters League, was founded by three women in 1923. It's important to understand this because we're now about ready to hit our 100th year. But started in 1923, the mission statement is very simple, believing all wars, international or civil, are a crime against humanity. So as I said in the introduction, um, I had actually joined the War Sisters League, thinking back about the context of when this march happened in 1982. Can we go back to April 4th, 1967, when Dr. King gave that incredible speech at Riverside questioning the war in Vietnam. I only raised that because as a post-World War II baby boomer born between 1946 and 64, for a lot of us, it was the Vietnam War that kind of made the entree. And I would be curious to know on this call, how many people are here knowing that that was their introduction in terms of the movement organizing. But like I said, one of the things that the War Resisters League tried to figure out and we saw that with the, uh, the, 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 during the UN session when the, when the women on commission, they looked at what was happening with the peace encampments happening in Europe with the deployment of these Euro missiles. And out of that conversation, some women thought, well, what would happen if we went to the Seneca Army Depot, which is up in Romulus, New York, that was holding a lot of these missiles that would be deported? What would happen if we had our own peace encampment in Romulus, New York? I was born in Albany, New York. I know exactly where that is. So when that idea got kind of circulated around, the WRL office here in Durham, North Carolina, and let's point out something about WRL. We always put our offices near military installations. We are a two hour drive from Fayetteville, North Carolina, Camp Lejeune, Fort Bragg, Seymour Johnson. When we were thinking about the idea of the Seneca Women's Peace Encampment, we were thinking about back to the civil rights organizing when Dr. King, before that speech in 1967, remember the March on Washington in 1928, 1963? I was 15 years old, what march? But that speech included economic justice and racial justice issues, issues as well. So we thought if we were to try to tap into the civil rights movement idea of walking marches from Durham, North Carolina to the Seneca Peace, and, Peace Encampment, 300 miles, that would be an opportunity not only to replicate the kind of organizing you would do back in the day, 
But all along the march, we would go through all of those cities along that route, Virginia, Pennsylvania, going into, uh, into North Carolina. Um, but a reference point I would say to you, um, thinking about this, Joan Baez, back in the early 60s, when she decided to join Dr. King down in Mississippi when they were talking about the civil rights movement, the combination of the civil rights movement in 63 and Dr. King having that organizing in the South, Freedom Summer in 64, certainly the speech in 67. But when he gave that speech on April 4, 67, a lot of pushback from the civil rights movement, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we go. But a lot of people said, why do you wanna bring that to this issue? But he had a basic question, why are we sending black men and people of color 8,000 miles away to another country of color in the name of democracy when we didn't even have it here in which we lived, thinking of put, put in that context. So in this short part that I only have to share with you, there's a really good quote that I thought about women and their importance in terms of this, in terms of peace organizing. The quote goes, the story of women, women's peace activism is a testament to the transformative potential of public dialogue. And what happened preceding 1982? I'm thinking of folk singer activist Joan Baez in 1972, June, she organized a ring around the Congress to question why are we funding that war in Vietnam? But that got to other people who were trying to figure out what was happening with the civil rights movement in terms of the right to vote, thinking about war activism, what we could do as individuals to, to protest, the, protest the idea of the funding in Vietnam. Vietnam War started in 1955. It didn't end until April 30th, 1975. So why did we have this march happening June 12th, 1982? I think one of the common boundaries or the common bonds about the weaponry that we had. Seneca Armor Depot was started like in 19 or in early ages, and they were a place to actually hold nuclear weapons that then would be to, sent over to Europe. So by the time the, the march happened in, in 1982, a big conversation was happening. Why are we, why are we sending Euro missiles over to Europe in terms of what, how, what we'd be doing in terms of organizing around the war? But for a lot of us who are not quite old enough to be a part of the civil rights movement, but really age-wise, definitely involved in the war in Vietnam. I remember I got arrested with a lot of people. Stop the draft week, 1967, Oakland Induction Center. We went to jail because we protested that war. But when the war ended, I just asked a question and I'll ponder it to everyone who's gonna follow up with me. How many people from that Vietnam War era decided they also then wanted to be a part of protesting in, in terms of nuclear weapons? What about our activity down in Central America in terms of what we were doing there? And what were we doing about nuclear power? Seabrook, New Hampshire was one of the first actions to happen around questioning, not only about nuclear weapons, but also nuclear power. And you saw kind of that transition. When I talk about what was the, the freeze, Randy Keeler and other people questioning about our stockpile. If you have that much stuff left over from the Vietnam War, what were you gonna do with it? And what was the national and international policies around war weapons? And I'll just close really simply by saying this, this is me. I just wonder generationally, this conversation we're having right now, what gets me really excited with the potential of what we can do is this. All of us post-war II baby boomers, born between 1947, 1946, and 64, look at the demographic shift we have now. Women are now the numerical majority. We didn't have the right to vote at some point. People of color, at one point we were bought and sold, are now going to be the majority by 2050, if not sooner, keeping in mind who was already here indigenous to these lands. But the most hopeful thing I see is this. 18-year-old to 40-year-olds now outnumber us in terms of the baby boomers and thinking of anyone born before us. If ever there was a time to have this conversation, to be in, com co in coalition and partnership, this would be it. And I will just end with saying by maybe, maybe, maybe the common factors in terms of now, 2022, this is a thought, clean air, clean water, no one hungry, no one homeless, everyone having access to an education and healthcare, and not only in English, thinking about the protect perpetually of where we are and then the War Resisters International. And WRL will celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2023. And Leslie Kagan, thank you, organized our 90th anniversary, I think at Georgetown. So thank you, Leslie. But I'm just humbled and honored to be a part of this conversation and how we do a collective we in terms of how we move forward. So that said, 
pass it on and I'll put some links in the chat. Next up, David Swanson is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He is executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator at RootsAction.org. Swanson's books include War is a Lie and When the World Outlawed War. He blogs at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He hosts Talk World Radio. He's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, among other awards. David Swanson, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. I'm going to try to share screen. Tell me if something's not being shared or you can't hear me. Um, I'm going to see if I can make about seven points in seven minutes. The first being that nukes are the tough on crime of foreign policy. There are less costly, less destructive, more effective means of protecting a country than nukes. Just as schools are not understood as crime prevention, even though they are the very best crime prevention tool in existence, the tools of diplomacy, cooperation, disarmament, the rule of law, and unarmed civilian protection are not thought of as capital D defense, even though they are the very best protection available. Claiming that nuclear weapons in Ukraine could have prevented a Russian invasion requires ignoring the fact that not putting missile bases into Poland and Romania and not threatening to put them into Ukraine also could have prevented a Russian invasion, as well as ignoring all the nations that have given up nukes, passed up having nukes, and not been invaded. Number two, nukes are also the we're aware of climate change of foreign policy. It is generally considered well-educated to acknowledge the existence of climate collapse, but to go on with all the practices and industries that are driving it, and to claim that there are endless ways in which you can undo the damage later. Similarly, you can get your op-ed into the New York Times or the Washington Post by admitting that your proposals could cause nuclear apocalypse, but proposing them anyway. I know Katrina can get better op-eds into the Washington Post, but most people can't. Uh, when Henry Kissinger is arguing that the universal consensus is reckless warmongering, uh, you just might have a problem. If you haven't uh, finished reading the quotes on this slide, you are that much better off for it. Uh, number three, the nuclear deterrence theory depends on threatening and seeming to mean it without meaning it. Getting Vladimir Putin to believe you mean it while counting on all the people paid and trained to do it, to recognize that you don't mean it, is one hurdle. Getting Putin to believe you mean it, but that you don't mean it too immediately or definitely, is another problem. Number four, one of the downsides of nukes is the serious risk of eliminating all life on Earth, there are plenty of minor downsides and dubious upsides, but it's all overshadowed by the super enormous downside that the doomsday clock tells us is more likely than ever, uh, and that the mere passage of time virtually guarantees, given the record of near miss incidents and accidents. Number five, apocalypse is becoming acceptable. Polls are finding a growing percentage of people in the United States willing to risk nuclear apocalypse and even bigger percentages willing to support policies that increase the risk. Meanwhile, there's been an increase in admitting that climate change exists, but not in support for doing anything about it. In fact, support for addressing climate change is declining. A recent study found that it's easy enough to get a majority in the U.S. to support nuclear war unless you give them a vivid description, unless you show them a picture of nuclear war. So here's one in this slide. Watching the day after works too. Number six, we are paying people piles of money for this, and they are buying our elections with it. The owners of this list of sociopathic corporations are getting stinking rich, putting all life on Earth at risk. Number seven, the solutions are painfully obvious. 
This is a graphic showing U.S. military spending over the years from 1949 until last year in constant dollars. So forget all the talk about inflation. This is where military spending has been and where it's come to. Uh, if, if you are the U.S. government, you commit to not using nukes in Ukraine or anywhere else. You join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. You begin complying with that and other treaties so that you're taken seriously. You remove your nukes from other countries. You've put them in six now, up from five recently. Uh, these are nuclear countries in addition to the nine we're told about. Uh, you begin uh, to take the weapons off the missiles. You dismantle and destroy the weapons beginning with the land-based. You facilitate the denuclearization of other countries by defunding militarism in general and investing in actually green energy. And if you're the U.S. public, you work on divestment, on education, on agitation, on organizing, on learning from and building on the history of successful popular actions against nuclear madness. We have much else to do. We have many reasons we supposedly don't have time to oppose nukes. But all of those reasons existed 40 years ago, too, and didn't stop people and needn't stop us. The U.S. government 40 years ago was a bunch of amateurs when it comes to public relations. Uh, as was talked about in a webinar earlier today, the US government put out a press release uh, 40 years ago today saying, we don't care about your, your rally. Now they know enough to keep silent rather than do that. But we ought to know enough to realize that people have an impact. And that activism in the 70s and 80s very likely didn't just reduce the stockpiles but also quite likely prevented a nuclear war. So yes, there is more to be done and the job was never completed, but what has been done could hardly be more significant. Now we need to finish the work and we need to finish off nuclear weapons. Thank you so much, uh, David, for that thorough presentation um, and sharing your wisdom with us really. Um, it is my, it's a blessing and an honor to uh, really introduce our next speaker, whom I've had the opportunity to work with in the past few years, and I was just recently in her presence uh, at the People's Summit, which was in opposition to the Summit of Americas. Uh, Medea Benjamin is the co-founder of the Woman That Peace Group Code Pink and the co-founder of the Human Rights Group Global Exchange. She serves on Code Pink's board of directors and has been an advocate for social justice for more than 40 years. She received numerous prizes, including the Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Prize from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the Peace Prize by the US Peace Memorial, the Gandhi Peace Award, and the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation Award. Take it away, please, Medea. Thank you so much. And it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you wonderful folks today. I'm actually speaking to you from Havana, Cuba, where I arrived yesterday. Uh, in less than a week, we raised over $25,000 to go through Mexico uh, to buy medicines for eight Cuban children that desperately need liver transplants and couldn't get the liquid solution needed for it. Uh, we couldn't buy the medicines in the United States because of a blockade, so we had to go through Mexico. And today we delivered them to uh, the children's hospital that does these operations. And we talked to the doctors about not only the wonderful work they do in Cuba, but the medical missions they have done around the world. Uh, one doctor told me that he had been to uh, Honduras, to Haiti, to Brazil. And a, a journalist who was with us said that she was in Haiti where they said, uh, God comes first and Cuban doctors second. Um, I say this because while I was there, I just was dreaming about all that we could do together uh, with the Cuban doctors and U.S. doctors to travel around the world helping people who don't have access to health care. And um, it, it's just uh, so heartbreaking to think uh, of what we could do and then look at what we are doing. Uh, looking at this war in Ukraine the massive destruction that's happening every day, the unconscionable uh, Russian attack on Ukraine, uh, the weapons industry that profits from this. 
and the missed opportunities that we've had for so long since the end of the Cold War uh, to put an end to this nuclear, uh, 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 the fear of nuclear war that hangs over our heads. Uh, when Truman rejected the plea to turn the bombs over to the United Nations under international supervision, when Reagan rejected uh, Gorbachev's pleas to give up Star Wars, when Clinton refused Putin's effort to cut the arsenals to 1,500 each, when Bush walked out on the ABM treaty and then Trump walked out on the INF treaty. And now we have both Russia and the United States, quote, modernizing the nuclear weapons to make them more usable. We have Russia uh, not so veiled uh, threats to use nuclear weapons. Um, it is terrifying the position that we are in right now. On the positive side, we have a vehicle uh, for our organizing, and that is the UN ban. Uh, the UN ban is something that people said would never happen. Uh, the UN ban is something people said would never be ratified, uh, but it has been. And now our job is to get the nuclear states to sign uh, that UN ban. Uh, I look at the uh, in 1982 gathering at Central Park and my heart soars uh, with the inspiration. I saw somebody put in a chat, well, you know, you get a million people there and things are worse off than they are now. We're supposed to be inspired by that. Well, I'm glad that David Swanson addressed the positive things that came out of that. And I think we should be inspired anytime people come together in mass numbers uh, to make the world a better place. Uh, there's um, not only the uh, the uh, pending uh, possible nuclear conflagration between the U.S. and Russia right now, uh, but we have the U.S. refusal to go back into the Iran nuclear deal uh, and the uh, threat of a war with Iran. We have the ongoing conflict in the Korean Peninsula that has never been solved. Uh, and we have uh, the U.S. constant aggression uh, and threats against China. I know there's a lot of older people who are always saying, why aren't young people involved in this movement? Well, I wanna say I'm extremely inspired by the young people. I'm inspired by their activism around the environment. I'm inspired by their activism against racism. I'm inspired by the movements that bring these issues together. I was just at the People Summit with you, Hanya, and many others in Los Angeles, where we had just a a place packed full of young people who were uh, very, very sophisticated in their analysis of the need to go beyond capitalism uh, and abolish, abolish the empire, that the U.S. should not be an empire. It's not good for the rest of the world and it's not good for us in the United States. Uh, I'm excited by young people and not so young people who are involved in the divestment movement uh, to best divest not only from fossil fuels, but to divest from the war industry, including the arms makers for nuclear weapons, who happen to be the same ones who are making the bombs that the US is using and selling to people in places around the world, including to Saudi Arabia that are devastating the people in Yemen. I'm excited by the movement that uh, we at Code Pink have initiated to get members of Congress to divest from the weapons industry. And there are young people in Chicago who have been outside uh, the offices of their Congress people every day for the last two weeks, uh, demanding that they sign this pledge to divest from the weapons industry. So there are there is a movement out there uh, that needs to grow, it needs to consolidate, it needs our support, uh, it needs um, our, our, our wisdom, and uh, I just want to end by reiterating something that uh, I think has come out of all of the speakers and the wonderful clips from the movies that we have seen so far. Uh, we are not going to get the solutions from Washington. We just saw the, uh, the Congress pass a $40 billion package to Ukraine that included billions and billions in weapons that will only fuel the fire uh, and increase the danger of a nuclear conflict. And we did not see one Democrat stand up and say, this is not the way to end the war. Um, but we do know that, that wars end and that peace and, and that change happens from the grassroots up. 
we know that only a global movement against militarism and the destruction of the climate is the only thing that will save life on this planet. And I'm excited to be with all of you to be part of that movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medea. As, as always, that was wonderful. Um, next up, Governor Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown was the 34th and 39th governor of California. He is the executive chair of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, chair of the California China Climate Institute, member of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, member of the Council on Criminal Justice, and the chairman of the Oakland Military Institute College Preparatory Academy. Governor Jerry Brown, please take it away. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's quite a list, uh, probably too long for any kind of extended focus. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I think the seriousness of the moment is well reflected in the doomsday clock that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists puts out and has been doing so since, I think, 1947. Uh, the clock stands 100 seconds uh, to doomsday. Now, this is a metaphor. Hopefully, it's a powerful metaphor, uh, but they used to make it minutes, and it's been as distant as 17 minutes uh, to midnight or doomsday. Now we're 100 seconds, and uh, there's some thought that it should get even closer because of the danger. So, no doubt, big danger uh, in the world today. And uh, Medea mentioned uh, a number of these things. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the things I want to say, because I've been around uh, for a long time now, I thought it was a, I can still remember my first campaign for the uh, Board of Trustees of the Los Angeles Community Colleges. That was in uh, 1969. So uh, through that period, I've been around, uh, certainly in the active days of the Vietnam War. So what we see today, though, is we're very fragmented. There are a lot more issues that galvanize people today. And the electorate, the people uh, uh, who are not even in the electorate, are, are very much invested in ideas that are contradictory uh, with other ideas that people are strongly invested in. So uh, the difficulty of mobilizing public opinion is extraordinarily challenging, just given the fact that public opinion is split into dozens uh, and dozens of different uh, ways and directions. From, far right proud boys to uh, uh, guys like Romney and, and then you have Cheney uh, attacking Trump, uh, although still very much of a, of a cold warrior, I would say, and then all the way on to the left in the Democratic Party and beyond. So this is quite a fragmented group that we're looking to, to mobilize. And we want to mobilize some, uh, some action, so we need some ideas that, if anything, uh, there are too many ideas to, to, to digest. Certainly, I would say that. But uh, for me, uh, working uh, on climate, I want to stress the climate. But before I do, I do have to acknowledge that the danger of nuclear, uh, not, not maybe not nuclear war, that's a danger, but a nuclear mistake or blunder or miscalculation is very real, uh, very real, very dangerous. And uh, the countries, the big countries with nuclear weapons, need to be doing a lot more than they are now to minimizing the risk. The risk, of course, is these nuclear weapons are in various physical locations tied together by software and human beings, and that can fail. And if it fails, it could be a catastrophe. So leaving nuclear to one side, and I wanna mention one more, and that's the arms trade. The arms trade in the world is almost a trillion dollars a year, a trillion, and of course, America is number one, the Russians are right, uh, are, are very high up, as are the French. Uh, I think the Chinese are coming on board. So you have major countries that sell and significant countries like Saudi Arabia that like to buy. And this itself is a scandal that a trillion dollars is going to, to this uh, weaponry. I'm not even talking about the nuclear weapons because tens of billions are going to that too. Uh, but I wanna focus uh, on what we have to do to wake ourselves up. Climate is coming. It's not like a nuclear blunder tomorrow. It could kill 50 million people, uh, or worse, we had a war and have a nuclear winter. But uh, the climate is inexorably changing uh, the way uh, we live on planet Earth. 
and that is going to make everything worse. So I think the climate, I think that's something that the Chinese have accepted. Uh, other countries have accepted this. We had the Paris Agreement. So we have some concrete uh, uh, framework. We have some past action. And that's something that uh, we should look to. Now, I use the phrase planetary realism. I take that term using realism in the hard boiled uh, Kissinger uh, canon kind of thought. But I put onto it the word planetary to indicate this is not about just America versus Russia or America versus China. This is a, uh, is a sense of the world that is realistic, grounded in hard facts, but looks at the climate threat, uh, looks at the, the threat of virus, looks at the threat of un, uh, growing and massive arms sales, and looks at the threat of what climate can do uh, to the world, and also looks at the financial uh, interaction that if uh, the countries of the world uh, don't cooperate, then a worldwide depression becomes very plausible. In fact, Fred Berkson wrote a book called US versus China. And he said, the only reason we didn't have a 1930s uh, global depression in 2008 is because China put up a trillion as did America. And uh, you can argue about how they did it and how they spent it, but they did prevent the collapse of the, uh, like we had in the 30s. So uh, I would say climate, uh, how the world economy is managed is a lot of a basis for China and the US to be talking. Now, when we're mobilizing, uh, I'd say climate uh, should be something that people can grasp, it's real, it's dangerous. And it's not just uh, mobilizing to uh, reduce carbon emissions, to change our fossil fuel dependent way of life, but we're mobilizing to get the big countries, uh, US, China, uh, Japan, the European Union, uh, Brazil, India, all these countries, they have to be part of it. So not only do we have the need, the opportunity to uh, reduce carbon emissions as a global mobilization, but to do that, we need some dialogue, serious dialogue. We need partnership. We can't have this rhetoric that, uh, what I call a Manichaean rhetoric, that we're good and they're bad. And we have to accept the world, it's not pretty. And we all have flaws and we can argue about who's worse or who's better. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is we have to partner with China, with Russia, with India, with Brazil, with a lot of countries we have massive disagreements with. But whatever those disagreements are, if the climate continues to warm as it is, we're putting more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere every day. And it's going to last, uh, in many cases, for hundreds of years. This is an utter disaster and we ought to mobilize. Uh, we need more than a million people uh, in Central Park again. We need people all over the world and we need to wake people up to the problem substantively, but with the absolute imperative of partnership. Now, when uh, the US representatives go over there to have a Shangri-La Shangri dialogue and talk about uh, the Pacific region, uh, okay, there's a lot of negativity going on, finger pointing and all bad this and all bad that. All right, but where is the imperative of partnership on climate or even partnership on managing the economy so we don't have a depression or partnership on dealing with the mutation of the virus and the next virus, which may be a lot worse than COVID. So there's plenty of planetary threats that are not a threat just to one country. It's not just our national interest. It's the common interest because it's the common vulnerability. And I would like to see as wide and as generic a, a set of ideas, banners, slogan to mobilize people on these basics. There's a lot of other issues you can find on the campus and communities and uh, various cities. Yeah, there's lots of problems, lots of evils, uh, lots of injustices. But let's focus on climate. Uh, let's focus on the dialogue needed uh, among the big countries. Because while they're fooling around, I would call it fooling around, but this competition, this armaments competition, this, this global East-West, uh, at the same time, 
the carbon emissions are relentless and the global economy is no less entangled. So we got a big challenge here to wake up, to become aware, to get clear about where we are. And I call that planetary realism. It's the planetary interest, not just the national interest. And people always say, well, that's good for America. I'm sure the Chinese say it's good for China. What's good for the world? What's good for humanity? And that has to be the touchstone as we mobilize, as we analyze, and as we galvanize ourselves to prevent the impending disaster that the bulletin of atomic scientists have said has never been closer than it is right today. Thank you very much, Governor Brown. Much appreciated. We're coming back from a quick break now. Um, if you are here, please uh, go to or share defusenuclearwar.org. You can sign up there for updates uh, and you can follow along there. We'll also be posting this video in, in full in the coming days. Uh, so be on the lookout for that at defusenuclearwar.org. Um, and on the Roots Action social media, as well as our partners and co-sponsors who are involved in this event. Um, uh, Hanya, I will uh, send it over to you now for the next introduction. Thank you so much, Ryan. I do appreciate you. Plus 416 people strong still on the call. Stay with us. It is an absolute privilege to introduce Leslie Kagan, who has been a peace and justice organizer for almost over 20, uh, 60 years. Among other things, her organizing skills have mobilized hundreds and thousands of people in public protests. In 1982, Leslie served as the coordinator of the June 12th March for Disarmament and Human Needs. Uh, pleasure to be in community with you, Leslie. Please take it away. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a little daunting to follow Dr. King, but okay, <laughs> I'll give it a try. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion today. Um, as you just heard, I had the incredible privilege to serve as the coordinator of the June 12th uh, <clears throat> March, March and Rally. Uh, unfortunately, people seem to prefer calling it the June 12th Rally. I don't know about anybody else, but the march was much more exciting. <laughs> um, I, let me take a few minutes to try and talk a little bit about the day itself, what actually happened um, and how it happened uh, and then the impact of it. Um, <clears throat> it was amazing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many of you were there um, and if you were there, um, maybe in your in the chat, you can add some thoughts on it. Um, if you weren't there, you missed something. <laughs> what can I say? Um, <clears throat> but it was, uh, first of all, it was a beautiful spring day in New York. The, the weather could not have been better for us. <clears throat> and the weather makes a difference. Uh, but most importantly, uh, on the streets of New York, wave after wave after wave of people um, managed to find a way to stand together, shoulder to shoulder, literally shoulder to shoulder, with people who's, uh, who probably they would most likely in their lives never run into. But they were there in common cause, and they were there not only to say quite loudly and clearly that uh, nuclear weapons needed to be abolished, but they also connected that fight to every other issue you can imagine. In their banners, in their signs, on their t-shirts, in the chanting, every single way, um, the connections were being made. And I must say that probably for some of the people in the national leadership of the coalition, some of those folks might not have wanted all those connections to be made. Um, there were internal struggles in the coalition. Uh, and one of them was how much do you focus only on nuclear weapons or predominantly on nuclear weapons and how much do you connect to other issues? 
Well, whatever those struggles were inside in the internal workings of the coalition, the people on the street were clear. They were connecting the issues. They were focused uh, in a unified way on nuclear disarmament and they were connecting the issues. Uh, we closed down Midtown Manhattan for the whole day. Um, and that wasn't even the purpose of the demonstration, but there were so many people, as you saw earlier in some of the video footage, it was a massive turnout. Honestly, I think there were really a million people there, but nobody knows. <laughs> nobody could count all those people. Uh, it was a sea of humanity. Um, most importantly, what I think we, on the organizing end of that day, did was that we opened up a space, a place, a space where people could make their own voices heard. Uh, we opened up room for people to bring their concerns and their demands into a public arena. And that is a powerful, it can be a powerful force. Uh, and I think a force in service of democracy, um, <clears throat> that the struggle for peace and justice is tied to the struggle for democracy. Um, <clears throat> what we, um, people have asked, well, what's the point of, you know, bringing a lot of folks onto the street, it doesn't change anything, it doesn't do anything. Mm -mm. Not true. Um, a good mobilization, and June 12th was a good mobilization, uh, does a lot of things. And this one, I think the success of it can be measured, certainly in the turnout, but in several other ways too. One was in what the process that was underway that ended up bringing those people onto the streets. And that, my friends, it was in the hands of local organizers, not only in New York City, <clears throat> where there was tremendous organizing effort on the ground community by community, but in literally hundreds, up to 600 groups around the country uh, said, we're gonna do something, right? About this mobilization, we're gonna get people there. That was the backbone of the organizing, the local work. And I honestly believe that the local work is always the backbone of all the social change movements we're involved in. So this was another uh, indication of how important that is. The other measure of success was the impact that the day had. Um, and others who are more policy wonks than I am, uh, can, can have and will continue to dive into that more deeply. But we clearly made an impact in Washington and probably on a global scale. And it takes change like this takes time, we all know that. Uh, but it, it, has, it had an impact that led to, many people have chronicled this, directly to it played a, a role in what happened three years later when the United States and the Soviet Union negotiated I, probably the first real serious uh, treaty related to nuclear weapons and in, even abolished one whole category of nuclear weapons. Um, that's having an impact. Uh, <clears throat> it also had an impact in the nurturing of a movement and movements take time to grow, to nurture, they they grow, they, they collapse, they regrow, et cetera, et cetera. But this demonstration helped in that nurturing period of a movement that led to that ongoing impact. Um, I think that uh, in terms of, just to keep it short, that, you know, that there are some real lessons to learn from what happened 40 years ago. And I just wanna rattle off a few of those. One is that even in a coalition that was um, constantly struggling with internal differences and problems and real issues, um, that we managed to keep focused on the work. In other words, it is possible to have differences, to air those differences, to struggle through them, and to keep the organizing work going.
we should not be shy about the differences. I think another thing that we learned out of that is that our movement actually is stronger when we connect issues. And in particular, when we are not shy about uh, addressing the realities, the dynamics of racism and white supremacy, when we are not shy about insisting on the power of local organizing and balancing that against the needs of national organizations, um, and that we are not wrong when we connect whatever our focal point is, and in this case, nuclear disarmament, when we connect to other issues. In fact, I believe we are stronger. Our work is stronger. It is more anchored in the reality of people's lives, um, and we have the potential to actually have a greater impact. Let me just wrap this up by saying that you know, what we do matters. What we did 40 years ago matters and what we do today matters. And when I say we, I don't just mean the few hundred of us on this call, which is great, um, but the larger we. Uh, and we need to be figuring out ways to keep that momentum constantly growing, getting stronger, stronger and wiser and more strategic. We need to be bold. We need to not be shy about being bold, bold in our thinking and bold in our actions. Uh, we need to, again, I would just wanna say it again because it is so critical. We need to take on uh, and really anchor our work in a commitment to taking on racism and white supremacy but also challenging and ending misogyny and homophobia, right? There are a whole bunch of issues that speak to the character of this country. Uh, certainly the reality of how militarism has infected every layer of our society. We need to challenge all of that. Yes, it is a big agenda, but if we don't take it all on, who will? And if we don't take it all on, I don't think we're gonna win on any front. So I honestly really in my bones believe that our ability to dismantle the nuclear weapon system and it's a system and to dismantle militarism means that our work must be anchored in making those connections and not being shy about that. Um, again, what we do matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Much appreciated all the hard work you've done then and now. Um, next up, Pastor Michael McBride, known as Pastor Mike, is a native of San Francisco and has been active in ministry for over 20 years. He is a national leader in the movement to implement public health and community-centered gun violence prevention programs, a graduate of Duke University's Divinity School with a Master of Divinity with an emphasis in ethics and public policy, Pastor McBride founded The Way Christian Center in West Berkeley, where he pre uh, presently serves as the lead pastor. He has been a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, MSNBC, CNN, the Huffington Post, and many other media outlets, providing commentary on issues related to faith and racial justice. Uh, pastor Mike, please take it away. Well, what a gift it is to be here with everyone, and I'm just so honored to, to join this amazing uh, collection of speakers and panel uh, panelists. You know, I was just RSVPing. I was telling Norman, I was just RSVPing. I was excited just to just to listen and learn because I, this has become such an important passion for me and, and, and to uh, our beloved who, who was just speaking, this idea that our work, our collective work for liberation, peace and justice has to be a deeply intersectional effort um, that we cannot work in silos and we cannot work apart from one another. Uh, we have to be in not just intellectual uh, awareness of one another, but we have to be in deep relationship with one another for it is through our relationships that we literally begin to adopt certain principles and, 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 and um, a, a level of trust with one another so we can actually move 
of this important work forward. And so uh, I am so excited to uh, be a, a newer board member of the Quincy Institute. Uh, they welcomed a, a bootleg preacher like myself so graciously into their ranks um, and have been educating me so phenomenally. I see Katrina on, and I'm sure there's all kind of other folks on as well uh, who are part of, 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 of our uh, wonderful, wonderful collection of, of peacemakers, right? And, and that's that's really is what is at my core. You know, I'm a fourth generation holiness Pentecostal preacher. Uh, that means we do speak in tongue, roll on the floor, swing from the chandeliers, and on a good Sunday, we levitate. Somebody say amen, right? We have some levitation going on today, I think a, a week after Pentecost. Um, but most people don't know that in my tradition of Pentecostalism, that there was and continues to be a deep, deep theological commitment to pacifism. That in my tradition, we had a very important uh, text that we always just say, follow uh, hold peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But this idea around peace and peacemaking was a critical, critical part of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, particularly at the turn of the 20th century. And so uh, this has always been a deep part of my tradition. You know, it, it, it really got more language in my consciousness uh, studying the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But as I began to, um, you know, excavate my own tradition, I learned that there were huge, huge commitments, uh, particularly around uh, the, the World War II times when we started to first see the use of nuclear armament being used that there was this commitment in our faith tradition to not be uh, of silent and on the sideline around the danger of, of militarization and particularly nuclear armaments. And so our work has, has, has not necessarily at a denominational level been conscious of that, but it has been very committed to the idea of how do we make sure militarization does not show up in our cities right? Uh, show up in our police department, show up in our law enforcement agencies. Uh, many may or may not be aware that we have an arms race right here in the United States of America. This conversation around the use of weapons of warfare in the hands of local, uh, oh, I'm sorry, of, of everyday Americans under the guise of the Second Amendment, that creates an occasion for law enforcement agencies to then arm themselves and now you have on the streets you have department of defense excess equipment being uh sold to local police agencies and they have a timeline six months or a year in which they have to use department of defense excess uh, military equipment they have to use that within six months or they are forced to take it away or return it back to the Department of Defense. And so what we're doing is we are actually now uh, incentivizing or putting pressure on local law enforcement agencies to use Department of Defense extra equipment on civilians in our own communities. I mean, this idea, right, that we have an arms race at every level of our social life in the United States of America ought to cause all people of faith, goodwill, no faith, or just common sense to shudder. Because I do believe what it does create is a desensitization of the use of violence in order to maintain an aura or an illusion of peace. And we don't want an illusion of peace and safety. We want real safety. We want real uh, uh, sense of of mutuality. And so the way in which we do this cannot be by depending on violence, um, particularly when the violence uh, that we are, are using um, literally sucks up, you know, 50, 60% of our general tax base, whereby we can't provide basic needs for individuals. And so then they are now you know succumbing to their desperation and their anger and their fear and their pain uh, which then fuels more violence right and so uh, my my hope is that our particular continued um, uh, 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 presence in this conversation as as was powerfully stated previous to me like all politics is local our organizing must be local and our organizing principles we say that we can't you know, start organizing people where we want them to be. We have to start organizing them where they are. 
and hopefully through a continued engagement of organizing and one-to-one conversations and collective meetings and, and, and principal uh, both protest, advocacy, conversation, we can hopefully shift people's sensibility about what is real, what is um, uh, possible, and certainly what is imagined. And in this country, I think we believe that we have an external threat to our liberty when we actually have an internal threat to our liberty. And that internal threat is Christian nationalism. It, it is neo-fascist sensibilities that have taken over segments of our political spectrum. And it's easy to just put it all into the Republican Party. But I want to say to you respectfully that the Democrats' um, uh, inability to, to, to parse out the white supremacist, neo-Nazi sensibilities in American law enforcement shows our complicity with the very same forces that are obviously visible on the Republican conservative side of the political spectrum. And so we all must have a, a, a consciousness and a, a accurate description of what is before us, or we may find ourselves being complicit to an evil that we cannot stop until it is too late. And I think that is part and parcel of why I'm so excited about this conversation. Obviously, none of us can imagine nuclear weapons being used in the United States upon civilians uh, in an urban, uh, rural context. But, you know, uh, I do believe uh, the presence of weapons of war uh, in the hands of everyday Americans, we might as well have a nuclear bomb in our backyard, right? Because those weapons can only be used to cause massive harm to many people who are not intended to be uh, the, 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 the uh, 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 victims of these weapons. So I'll stop there. It's a Sunday. I'm a black preacher. I can go on and on and on. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting fired up, but I'm just grateful to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Pastor, you most certainly took this Muslim woman to church and back today. So I do appreciate you for your encouragement and your, your, your preaching. Um, I'm glad and delighted to introduce this powerhouse, uh, Katrina Vander, uh, Vandenhugel, who's an editorial director and publisher for The Nation. She served as editor uh, of the magazine from 1995 to, 19, to 2019, a frequent commentator on US and international politics for ABC, MSNBC, CNN, and PBS. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and she writes a weekly column for the Washington Post. Bandon Hooville is also an author of several books, including The Change I Believe In, Fighting for Pro Progress in the Age of Obama. I'm the co-author with Stephen F. Cohen of the Voices of uh, Glanost interview with Gorbachev reformers. Uh, Katrina, please take it. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing I'm thinking of right now is following Pastor Mike McBride. Um, thank you. I want to just say, picking up on the brilliant remarks you've made with such clarity and humanity, uh, Pastor McBride. In uh, 1966, James Baldwin, who was then a member of the nation's editorial board, wrote a piece, several pieces about occupied territories across the United States. And it was about the policing and the war machine in the cities of this country. So we have many, many years to think hard about how what we're talking about today connects as it must. Um, I wanted to just begin with the point that the danger of nuclear war is now at its highest level since World War II. We used to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I think uh, unless the brutal, brutal barbaric war in Ukraine is soon ended with a ceasefire and a political diplomatic resolution providing for Ukraine security, sovereignty, the escalation may well lead to, as Governor Brown, I think, talked about it, not necessarily war, but accidental blunder miscalculation that could be beyond words as we you know, just were seen with the day after, and you didn't even see the parts where it hits in Lawrence, Kansas. We live in a time of um, possibility, but also in denial. I mean, the loose talk, the kind of normal, normalization of talking about nuclear weapons, I don't know about you, but it's terrifying. I, don't, I watch too much TV, but it, there's a sense that you have combatants as journalists, or you have those involved in the military industrial complex who have a vested interest and they're, it's not even disclosed on TV, but 
instead of conversation dialogue, a dialogue at least, about how maybe instead of building up weapons, the US could neg negotiate about a shared security with parts of the world that are affected by this war. But let's be honest, there, but maybe 90% of this world is only affected right now in terms of growing hunger, insecurity, deprivation. The hope is that there's the a, a rising up of a non-aligned movement, which I think is potentially powerful in places like Central America, South America, or uh, Northern Africa, Asia. What must never free, be forgotten, and it was interesting to see someone who I think gutted our politics, but on this issue found light somewhere, Ronald Reagan in the Capitol talking about nuclear war must never be fought, can never be won. You don't hear that talk today. And I think someone on uh, the previous call I was on reminded that in a hearing about a year ago, some congressman asked someone testifying on behalf of nuclear disarmament, down, downsizing, not just abolition. It's too dangerous what you're saying. You can't, you can't ignore the importance of nuclear weapons to the patrimony of this country. The, um, you know, there was talk in the chat about which, what's the anniversary? The anniversary is the largest political demonstration, I think, and still in US history, June 12th, 1982 in New York City. But we mark another anniversary this year, 40 years ago, Olaf Palme, the Swedish prime minister, someone committed to peace, humanity, and justice, convened an international commission. And it played a major role in ending that Cold War, though we literally have a hot war now. And if, you know, when we talk about security, it's so often militarized, a word that's been used today. But in fact, there's an idea which has been around for years called common security, human security. It's kind of a playbook, a peace playbook. And by the way, we have to make sure that peace is not considered a subversive word in this country. I'm, ki I'm not kidding. I think it, some people think it's dangerous, but the, it's about the urgent need for in international collaboration to end and prevent war and to move away from the illusion that nuclear deterrence can provide security. It's about addressing the existential climate crisis. It's about addressing pandemics, which are not gonna be met by nuclear weapons, global hunger, inequality, migration. And it calls, more practically calls for resumption of scientific dialogue, strategic dialogue, which is critical as we think about a new world because we do need to live in the world as it is, but we need to imagine a world as it might be because I think that mobilizes people um, wanted to come back very quickly to the local. The local is global. As Leslie said, the importance of local, of states, of cities. I just received an email about the conference of mayors. You know, many of them have supported dialogue with to end the war in Ukraine, but also abolition of nuclear weapons. And you have people around this country, state legislators, states, uh, city councils, which are using tools that are kind of like the freeze, if you remember the freeze 1982, updated like divestment from the companies that make bombs, that make nukes. And back from the brink, which Medea spoke of, has ties around this country from state legislators to city council to sheriff. Um, there's stuff going on. I mean, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons is vital. I mean, we don't treat the UN very well in this country, but the global assembly is the world opinion, apart from the kind of men of the apocalypse and the Security Council. And this idea of advancing a treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons, some 160 countries have voted in favor of adopting the treaty. It demands the ratification of 50, I believe they're 10, before it acquires legal standing. And it's shameful that no nuclear country has expressed support for it but it stands as a moral document and is galvanizing peace movements in many ways. I mentioned the fossil fuel, uh, Jerry Brown spoke about the existential crisis. We could take the nuclear movement, take a page from the fossil fuel divestment movement. Don't bank on the bomb, identifies corporations that produce key parts from nuclear weapons and key European pension funds have invested in this divestment movement. I agree totally with the view that abolishing militarism demands this understanding that it runs through our broken democracy. We sit here with two nuclear strategy documents, which no one has had any real put input into, nuclear posture review 
and the nuclear strategic doctrine, which make Russia and China our perpetual adversaries. The nuclear posture review has no input. There's no accountability and it will determine how we live for years. And I think what's important, and it's an old fashioned idea, is there are many good, many good legislators. There's good legislation in the Congress, but we have to build, build power. As someone said earlier, countervailing force. I hate to be old fashioned, but there was a president who everyone came to and said, do it, do it. And he said, don't ask me to do it, go out and do it. And I think we need to build that power um, and build it through communities we've all talked about who may not see the peril of nuclear war, see the guns, think of March for Our Lives yesterday. You know, that's of this moment. But the ultimate form of violence in fundamental ways is the use of nuclear weapons. So I just wanna conclude by saying, um, the nation received Jonathan Schell, our great writer, visionary writer who wrote The Fate of the Earth and other documents exploring this in the connection between nuclear and climate. We received a Global Green Award for our coverage of nuclear abolition. And I had the good fortune to receive it from Mikhail Gorbachev, who is the most radical and committed arms reductionist ever to lead a nuclear country, a supporter of nuclear abolition. He's 91 years old, living outside of Moscow, horrified by the events in his country and in Ukraine from which his wife came. He sends greetings to these gatherings, which gather on June 12th. And while we look at a discredited foreign policy establishment that tells us what we should think, uh, we need to assist that, uh, as he did, that abolition of nuclear weapons is not unachievable, is not a utopian goal. And I'd close with echoing a principle stated many times by Gorbachev. If we don't attempt what seems impossible, we will risk facing the unthinkable. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, next up is our own Hanya Jodat. Hanya is a Roots Action organizer, California Democratic Party Assembly District Delegate, National Coordinator of the Lift the Sanctions Campaign with Progressive Democrats of America, Middle East Alliances. She is the president and co-founder of Muslim Delegates, and she served as a national delegate for Bernie Sanders. She's a published author, co-founded Women's March Los Angeles, served as a board member for three years in LA and for the state of California, and has been recognized by the National Iranian American Council as the new rising activist under 40, as a new rising activist under 40, the city of Los Angeles, the board of Los Angeles County Supervisors and city of West Hollywood. Take it away, Hanya. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I wanna express my immense gratitude to those of you who have participated in this historic event to honor and uphold global peace, freedom, justice, and diplomacy, and a world free of nuclear weapons and bombs. Today, my heart stands in solidarity with my sisters and brothers in Iran who have lived under tremendous social and economic challenges for decades. In spite of the darkness, Iranians continue to find a way to smile, laugh, dance, and fight for freedom. When I was invited by my colleague, Norman Solomon, to speak about the Iran deal, my heart sank to my stomach because I was so honored to share the space with my mentors, but really didn't know how to do this topic justice because I'm by no means an expert, but perhaps a student who asks questions and wants to challenge uh, imperialism inside and outside of the US. To really understand where we are with the Iran deal, it is very important to discuss the history of the agreement and learn a bit about it. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which went into effect in January of 2016, was really designed to impose restriction on Iran's civilian nuclear enrichment program. And the heart of, uh, and in the heart of the negotiation with Iran were the five permanent uh, uh, members of the UN Security Council, which are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the US, and Germany, collectively known as the uh, P5 plus one. Uh, the European uh, Union also took part in this negotiation. Um, two of the major world powers that stood really in opposition to the deal were Israel and Saudi that wanted more of an involvement in the negotiation as they both feared a nuclear armed Iran. And let us also be very clear that both those countries have been at the forefront of uh, violating human rights and committing crimes against humanity. Um, as a side note, um, Iran, as 
the signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has been signed since the 1970s, had agreed to forego the de development of nuclear weapons. However, after the overthrow of the Pahlavi dynasty in 1979, Iranian leaders pursued this technology as a continuity to the previous dynasty. Within the terms of the U.S. agreement, Iran agreed to nuclear restrictions and the accord limited the numbers and the types of center refuge Iran can operate, the level of its enrichment, as well as the size of its uh, stockpile um, of enriched uh, uranium, in addition to monitoring and verification, which would then eventually implement protocols that would allow inspectors from the Atomic Energy Agency and the nuclear watchdogs unprecedented access uh, to its nuclear facilities and undeclared sites. And in return, the EU, UN, and US agreed to nuclear-related sanction relief. Sadly, however, the Trump administration, especially when Secretary Pompeo became Secretary of State, abandoned the JCPOA, even though Iran remained committed to the accord, and uh, therefore Iran imposed over 1,500 extreme and secondary sanctions on Iran's economy, petroleum, national guard, central banks, agriculture, and medicine, crippling really the barely middle class and the poor. Um, I think it's safe to say that the world was looking for the Biden and to the Biden administration to break with the Trump's Middle East strategy and resume talks with Iran to rejoin the deal. But unfortunately, after several talks in Vienna uh, with the signatories of the deal, there isn't really a positive light at the end of the tunnel. Um, if the U.S. really wants to return to compliance within the deal, the U.S. would have to lift the sanctions inconsistent with the JCPOA on Iran's ability to sell its oil or use the money from the central bank. Iran is also asking for the FTO designation to be lifted from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps that has been added to the terrorist list by, um, the, administ by the Trump administration. We are truly near... Uh, 18 months into the Biden administration, and the nuclear crisis is really growing worse day by day. The U.S. strategy uh, to ignore the deal has resulted in Iran producing significant quantity of uranium to the 60% threshold. And if Iran decides to enrich the stockpile further, it would have enough weapons, uh, grade material for nuclear weapon. Very recently, the U.S. and European states uh, convinced the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors to pass a censor resolution on Iran, now prompting Iran to retaliate by installing even more advanced uh, centrifuges and turning off 27 of the agency's monitoring cameras. Meanwhile, the Israeli military has been practicing bombing Iran's nuclear facilities. Ultimately, what this really comes down to is a potential decision by the Biden administration. Do they have the political courage to avoid another escalation of a potential war, which majority of American bipartisans don't want, or um, are they willing to begin another closely inhuman catastrophe? It's safe to say that the Biden was elected because majority Americans didn't agree with the Trump policy. So now the responsibility and the choice to lead with diplomacy falls on the administration. I'll end by saying this, I grew up during um, the time of Iran and Iraq war. And I remember the catastrophe that war caused um, living in Iran on our mental state, on our economy. And I have to say, I, my heart goes out to Yemeni mothers, Iranian mothers, mothers in Palestine, mothers in Iraq, who have had to, and Afghanistan, who have had to bury their children because of aerial bombings. Um, and I hope for a global movement and I hope for peace for not only people of color in this country, but people overseas. Thank you so much. And I know that uh, my colleague unfortunately had to log off. So I will be uh, introducing our next guest, which I'm honored to. Uh, we will be watching and listening to a few clips from soon to be released Diffuse Nuclear War podcast featuring uh, the one and only Daniel Ellsberg produced by Academy Award nominee, uh, nominated director Judith um, uh, Elric, uh, Elric. And after the clip we'll hear back from both Jan uh, and, uh, by Judith and Dan. Uh, now, Daniel Ellsberg is a former consultant to the Defense Department and the White House, uh, specializing in problems of the command and control of nuclear weapons, nuclear war plans, and crisis decision-making. He later joined the Defense Department and then the State Department. 
1969, he preoccupied the 7,000 page top secret uh, of which later became known uh, as the Pentagon Papers and gave it to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In 1971, he gave it to the New York Times, the Washington Post and 17 other newspapers. Dan subsequent trial on 12 felony counts posing possible sentence of 115 years was dismissed in 1973 on grounds of governmental misconduct against him, leading to the conviction of several White House aides and figuring in the, uh, figuring in the uh, impeachment uh, uh, proceedings against uh, President Nixon. Ellsberg has been lecture, uh, lecturer, scholar, writer, and an activist on the dangers of nuclear era, wrongful US interventions, and the urgent need for uh, patriotic whistleblowing. And it's he's an author of four books. What an honor to be in your presence. Uh, and Judith is an American film director. She co-directed the 2009 documentary, The Most Dangerous Man in America, which follows Daniel Ellsberg and explores the events leading up to the 1971 publication of Pentagon Papers. The film was nominated for Best Documentary Feature at the 82nd Academy Award and was screened at the 2009 Toronto International Film Festival. Please take it away. Anne, it's always wonderful to be with you. And it's so uh, such an honor to be with this auspicious group of people. I think we're gonna just go to these clips pretty soon. It's, um, there are two minutes, there's four of them. They're based on an interview I did with Dan shortly before the um, beginning of the Ukrainian invasion. So uh, we're gonna update that a bit when we come back and talk with you. At the time that I was writing guidelines for the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara in 1961, for the annual operational war plans of the United States, general nuclear war plans. Uh, at that point, the plan I was supplanting or modifying, I hoped, was uh, the last plan left by the Eisenhower administration, which provided for hitting every city in Russia, the Soviet Union then, and China under any circumstances in which we were in any armed conflict with the Soviet Union alone. His plan was simply, under any of those circumstances, strike first in nuclear terms against the Soviet Union and China. The Joint Chiefs of Staff estimated in 1961 that the effects of our carrying out those plans, the Eisenhower plan, which was not a hypothetical plan for 10 years in the future or something. It was the annual operational plan for which the weapons existed and were on alert all the time. They estimated it would kill 600 million people, 100 holocausts, 325 million in the Soviet Union and China alone, another 100 million in the satellite countries, another hundred million of our allies in West Europe would be killed by the fallout from our attacks on the Soviet bloc. Without a single warhead of ours falling on West Europe, fallout from our attacks in the Soviet bloc would annihilate our NATO allies. And finally, in areas contiguous to the Soviet Union or China, for a total, as I said, of 600 million killed. Now, when I saw that estimate in the White House, I thought that was the most evil planning that had ever existed in the history of humanity. When I say that there is a step that could reduce the risk of nuclear war significantly, that has not been taken, but could easily be taken, and that that is the elimination of American ICBMs, I'm referring to the fact that there is only one weapon in our arsenal that confronts a president with the urgent decision of whether to launch 
nuclear war. And that is the decision to launch our ICBMs because they are vulnerable in a way that our submarine launch weapons at sea are not vulnerable and our planes can be called back. In fact, they don't even have to be called back. They can take off on positive control, it's called, and circle until they get a positive order to go ahead. And they can do that for hours, actually, uh, delaying any decision as to what the situation is. That's not true for ICBMs. They are fixed location, known to the Russians, and uh, the Russians have missiles, both sub and ICBMs, as we do, that can destroy the ICBMs the fixed location ICBMs. Should we have mutual elimination of ICBMs? Of course. But we don't need to wait for Russia to wake up to this reasoning that I'm giving here to do what we can to reduce the risk of nuclear war because it is the existence of ICBMs on both sides that keep both sides on high alert. To remove ours, is to eliminate not only the chance that we will use our ICBMs wrongly, but it also deprives the Russians of the fear that our ICBMs are on the way toward them. We have to remember that it's only been in the last 70 years that weapons existed where a single warhead would wipe out a city or even a metropolitan area with a thermonuclear weapon. The weapons actually are designed to kill people or to threaten to kill people, which is the way they've actually been used a number of times, quite specifically in crises. The way you use a gun when you point it at someone in a confrontation. You are using the gun. If you get your way without pulling the trigger, the best use of the gun. And we've done that, and on other occasions we didn't get our way with the threats and back down. I don't believe, having been close to this for 50 years now, that all of those threats were bluffs and they were avoided from going into full nuclear war because the other side backed off in various ways. In other words, the threats can work. Of course they can work. When you point a gun, uh, whether you're a policeman or a vigilante or a bandit going into a 7-Eleven, no legitimacy, whatever, but of course you can walk out with the contents of the cash register. So there's a lot of fingers on a lot of buttons in the world. And that has been kept very secret from the public uh, so as not to worry them. Could this actually arise? Is it, I'm, I'm saying it's a possibility then, a real possibility, not zero and not close to zero, of all-out war actually occurring on the basis of a false alarm. We have had many false alarms. These last 70 years, in other words, are like no others in the history of humanity. How can it be that this program remains? Uh, why are we thinking of spending uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars over the next 30 years, a hundred billion in the next 10 years, to produce a replacement for the Minuteman 3 when we should eliminate the Minuteman 3, the current ICBMs, altogether rather than replacing them? Why is it? mainly because it's profitable to Northrop Grumman or its rivals Boeing or Lockheed to produce this, and not only to them. If it was only those corporations, uh, no doubt it would be easier to, uh, to oppose it. But they have carefully distributed the earnings from that and the, the jobs and the, the votes and everything across 35 states. And we should have eliminated them in the early or mid-60s. That's half a century ago. Our country, the first to use nuclear weapons against humans, has led the way at every step of the way here. 
in the escalation of the arms race. The nuclear war planners, of which I was one, who have written plans to kill billions of people, was a conspiracy to commit omnicide, near omnicide, the death of everyone, a conspiracy to, uh, together, secretly, to carry out, under some conditions, massacre. Can humanity survive the nuclear era? We don't know. I choose to act as if we have a chance. I am almost certain that we do have a chance. I mean, there's so much to be said, and it's so... Um, inspiring to see everyone here who is hopeful about the future. And I don't think that, I think that we need to be informed to be hopeful and realistic. And to, and the, what Daniel's um, uh, message has been is um, the dangers of nuclear war. And I think that's part of what made the day after so important. And the whole, and the hope is that film at, can inspire people to have an impact. And these short videos are an experiment, which worked somewhat not exactly right today, but um, they'll be up on the website and we'll be expanding them and doing a podcast. But I just wanted to say something about the impact of the film that we made on Dan, the most dangerous man in America, and that that directly inspired um, Edward Snowden to release the secrets he did because of seeing that film. So I like to look at that as an example of how we can actually inspire people to do things when they know more. Oh, louder. Okay. Oh, I turned down my volume. I'm sorry. Thank you, Norman. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> so I, just to say that quickly, if you didn't hear it, that, that the film we made about Daniel Ellsberg inspired Edward Snowden to release the secrets he did. And we, you know, make these films and these pieces. And this was an experiment, which Norman really generously offered to um, support this idea of trying something new, which was an animated podcast, which we're going to expand into a full podcast. And not sure what else we're going to do, but we're experimenting as we all need to do, I think, in these days. Um, but let me hand it over to Dan. I just want Dan, I, I, I'd love you to talk about where you were on June 12th, 1982, because you happened to mention this to me, which you often do, and then I go, why didn't we put that in the film? But this wouldn't be, have been for that film, but I think it's a great story. You're, you're taking me back, Judy, to the days of my youth, your, uh, 1982, when I was 51. <laughs> and um, the... <clears throat> Uh, I missed the million person uh, march and demonstration Central Park because I was on a ship called the Sirius owned by Greenpeace, which was then uh, going away, leaving then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg uh, Harbor, where we'd gone in and 10 days earlier had released 2,000 helium-filled balloons over Leningrad City with cards on them uh, saying, stop Soviet testing now, and uh, also actually revealing what turned out to be a state secret at that time in Russia and Soviet Union, and that was the number of tests they had actually made which was uh, not at all discussed. It's not discussed uh, any more than our background in that is discussed and really known to people here. But they uh, took away our right to be in the harbor, uh, towed us out to sea, actually, with uh, two tugboats and uh, armed guards on the bridge to see that we didn't uh, cause any more trouble with AK-47s. But the, uh, that was at the same time, essentially, or it was actually 10 days before this particular march. It occurs to me that something was going on then that is reminiscent, very reminiscent of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that the Soviets, having been, by their account now, lured into Afghanistan by American uh, disinformation that implied that we were about to uh, take over Afghanistan by way of who the Soviets regarded as a CIA agent, the, the then uh, leader of Afghanistan by virtue of a coup, Hafizila Amin. And uh, we were encouraged, as Brzezinski put it later, to give the Soviets their Afghanistan. Um, correction, come back, to give the Soviets their Vietnam, which actually we did do. Uh, they lost 
15,000 men. They may have lost uh, the same number now in about 100 days, but they lost over the next decade uh, 13 to 15,000 troops. And the Afghans had their Vietnam and lost over a million people. And during that period, when these people were meeting in a Central Park, the, uh, by virtue of the histories now by Selig Harrison and others of the Afghan war, it's clear that the U.S. wanted to keep them there. With our support to the Mujahideen, which eventually involved stingers, as we're now seeing in Vietnam, to take down Soviet helicopters, the Soviets, having gone in in late 79 and early 80, had within a year and certainly by two years, in 82, realized they were in a stalemate and weren't going to get any further and wanted out. This was under Brezhnev. And uh, we're looking to us somehow to give them some way uh, to help in mediation, to get some kind of way out. But that was not what the U.S. government wanted. The word that people in the White House uh, used in, ter in terms of what they wanted to see in Afghanistan was to bleed the Soviets. The word that our Secretary of Defense, Austin, recently used about our objective now vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, to bleed the Russians. And as I say, it did it then, and it's doing it now. But as usual in a counterinsurgency operation, at a cost of 10 to 1 of the victims, the people being attacked. Uh, I actually think that right now, uh, our Biden, who has talked about regime change, he's backed away from that in principle, but uh, said, no, that's not what we want. But earlier, he had said more than once, uh, Putin must go, there must be regime change. As Austin said, we want to weaken uh, the Russians to the point where they can't uh, undertake such an aggression again, can't invade Moldova again, can't invade Georgia, that'll be a hundred years, never. That's a recipe for endless war, as is Lindsey Graham and others, other hawks in Congress, not all, Demo not all Republican by any means, uh, who want victory to take, uh, to go beyond the, the status quo of February 24th, uh, when Putin's clear-cut, blatant, murderous aggression uh, started at that point, to go beyond that, to take every last Russian soldier out of the Donbass and out of Crimea, where they had been for the previous eight years. Again, we've shown no capability of doing that, unless possibly we follow the advice of some people, and that is to go beyond what Biden has so far uh, done, and that is to take part in the conflict ourselves, which would confront Putin with the real possibility of defeat in the Donbass. Nothing less than that would probably do that. In which case, he's made clear, the, uh, the, the Russians do not intend to be defeated by a superpower. There has never in, this, in, in my lifetime been actual armed conflict overtly between the US and Russia. So neither side has been tested by their willingness to be defeated, clearly, by the other rival superpower. And in this case, Putin is using his nuclear weapons, as was seen in that segment earlier. He is pointing them in a confrontation and he's saying, if NATO comes in, if the U.S. comes in overtly, and not just the proxy war aspect, there is a danger of nuclear war, which his foreign minister Lavrov has, has mentioned a number of times. He's using his nuclear weapons, in other words, to keep us out from overtly uh, entering, and successfully so. And I hope, by the way, that threat continues to be taken seriously. It doesn't have to be certain or even highly likely. Yes, I hope that we will not enter that war directly, and that's considerably dependent on whether we and the peace movement here and the rest of the public uh, recognize that to do that would be in threatening all of civilization. But how then is this to be ended? And uh, unless it's with negotiation and an end probably along the lines of the pre-existing 2023-24 situation, which would be, from the point of view of Ukraine, not their objectives as of now, and yet would terminate a war that uh, not only is killing Ukrainians at almost surely a higher rate than the Russians, but which has 
month by month the possibility of escalating into nuclear war. And that's something the whole, the whole world uh, has an interest in avoiding. So the possibility uh, of that is not is scarcely being uh, taken account of by those people who want to very plausibly aim uh, at victory in this and full victory in a world uh, where this is uh, really possible. There's no question of downgrading any of the dangers and ills and harms and oppressions that are inflicting the world and that are inflicting this country and by this country when I say there is no problem more important than uh, the lowering the risk of nuclear war. And what is the chance of actually doing this, especially after this four months? Very low. It's gotten much worse than it was six months ago. If we go back 60 years to the Cuban Missile Crisis, that was the only earlier time in my lifetime when the US and Russians, or then Soviets, were on the verge of armed conflict, when both were nuclear powers, 60 years ago. And Dan, you yeah. were there at that yeah. time. Yeah, I was involved. I'm, in, I'm sorry, uh, I know you could, I, I mean, I have, you know, been uh, inspired by you talking for many, uh, you know, for many hours, and I, I know you have so much to say, and it's all so vital, but I think we're on a very short leash here, and, and Norman would love, needs us to wrap up, so I'm just... Um, there I, is one thing I'd, li yeah, I'd like to say, ahead, this, which is this, there. put ourselves back I put myself back to when I was 51, some, but maybe some of you others are uh, old enough to remember 82, uh, not probably 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but 82. And by the way, 83, something we won't have time to talk about here, actually was the other time we came extremely close to nuclear war because Andropov, the chairman then, believed that Ronald Reagan was mad and might be planning a first strike. So the possibility of escalation there on the Russian side existed a year after the people in Central Park called for a freeze. And by the way, Brezhnev at that year was still alive and was uh, was calling for a freeze, actually joined it. Now, thinking back to 82, how many people in that crowd and the more informed ones knew that we were then putting in intermediate range missiles, Pershing II and cruise missiles, into Germany of the kind that could decapitate Moscow in a matter of minutes, something that concerned them as much as the prospect of medium range IRBM in Cuba had uh, concerned the US, where Kennedy felt he had no choice but to take risks of all out nuclear war as Putin is doing now, and Putin complaining about ABM sites on his borders in Poland and Romania, which could be converted to uh, intermediate range missiles of the kind both sides have now uh, gotten, uh, uh, allowed themselves to make, having rescinded the intermediate range missile treaty of 1987. I Coming back then to 82, who believed that the missiles that the Soviets had put in, the SS-20s uh, in uh, their area, intermediate range, and our Pershing II would be dismantled by agreement in 1987, five years later. Mm. Who believed that the Berlin Wall would be down in 1989? Well, I'll tell you, it was not just that those events were unlikely, they were impossible, mm. they were unthinkable. And yet they did happen, and in considerable part because millions of people, including that million in Central Park, had been doing what they could, making their voices heard about this and their demands heard, that this is an intolerable situation, which is true right now. And they were acting in response to Martin Luther King's point that silence at some times is betrayal silence about the nuclear dangers that are going on right now is a betrayal of this generation and the next generation and all the generations after that and uh, we are not being silent and with some actual chance that we will be heard thank you dan thank you dan yeah, I've, yeah. I've, yeah. I, you, I, and you always come back and wrap it up brilliantly and thank you for that because it did you did leave us on a 
positive note. It's hard, really, it's hard not to want to sit here for yes. hours to listen to so much history because <laughs> you can here. Yeah. But I want to hear, I know Norman still has not had a chance and I really appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Judith. Um, uh, Dan, it's an honor to be in company with you here today. You've paved the way for many of us. And um, thank you for uh, your advocacy, your work and your words of wisdom. Um, in the absence of my colleague, I'll pass it on to my other colleague, David Swanson to take over for Ryan. Uh, but in the meantime, I am excited to uh, introduce Hori Pedersen Smith, who is a middle, uh, who is a Michael Ratner Middle East fellow at IPS. He is a research, he researches US empire borders and uh, immigration. Uh, Hori graduated from Clark University. Uh, graduate School of uh, Geography in Massachusetts after completing a dissertation that focused on militarization and sovereignty. He is one of the co-authors and organizers of the 2015 Black Solidarity with Palestinian Movement, which uh, was signed by over 1,100 Black activists, artists, and scholars. So delighted to hear uh, from you. Fudi, take it away, please. Thank you. And what an honor to be introduced by Hania and to follow the the absolute legend that is Daniel Ellsberg. Um, you know, I, I prepared remarks today uh, where I talk about, you know, this catastrophe in Ukraine, um, this crisis, and uh, the not only the horror of what's happening, but the missed opportunities, particularly the missed opportunities as they pertain to nuclear disarmament. I may get to those, but I've, <laughs> I've been moved uh, to actually not only rethink what I want to say to you all, with you all, but to just to rethink a lot of things. And I've been moved by hearing the words of Ms. Mandy and Ms. Leslie, who were present on this incredible uh, day that we're commemorating 40 years ago, and to see the footage uh, of that day, which, you know, I, th this, this, this action happened before my time, but I've heard about it. It's kind of legendary. But to see the footage is, is something different. Um, and what I'm hearing uh, you know, from the people who were captured in that footage and from our veteran activists who are on this uh, presentation, I'm hearing expansive possibility, the possibility that comes with the power of mobilizing such vast numbers of people with such purpose. And so, first of all, um, gratitude and shout out to intergenerational spaces, which we need much more of. And let me say on that point that as we talk about the threat of nuclear war um, that nuclear weapons pose today, um, I am uh, one of many people who grew up in a time when those threats were less visible than I think to many people who are on uh, this call. I did not grow up doing duck and cover drills. Uh, the Cold War and the kind of threat of nuclear violence felt more like a relic in my, my little hometown, which I believe Ms. Mandy uh, said it is shared. I grew up in Albany, New York, uh, too. And I would see old air raid sirens and I would say, Mom, what is that? And she would explain to me what these things once did, but they were this kind of leftover from a different time. And so it's critical for folks who experience that time, who experience the threat of nuclear war, um, who experience other wars, but also experience these protests. Your lessons are so critical to us. Um, and I'm going to um, not only ask that you share those lessons, but I'm going to also offer a plea. I will plea that not only do you transmit to younger folks the threat of nuclear violence, but please also transmit to younger generations the power of the movements that counter that violence. Because that's what is, is missing uh, today, in my opinion. I'm very concerned that um, the conventional wisdom today says that if we want something to change, you know, we should vote for some good people or some decent people and then kind of hope for the best. <laughs> and um, to say it's not working is a, an understatement. Um, uh, in, in what, what I'm seeing in that footage from 1982 and what I'm hearing 
uh, in the lessons being told by those who are present in that time. So you don't just hope for the best, you fight for the best, you mobilize. Um, and what a critical lesson uh, in this time, in this time of such incredible suffering um, and catastrophe and um, real, um, real powerlessness that I, that I know I'm not the only one uh, who has been kind of reckoning with. I've been looking around, especially these past few years and wondering among other things, what, what constitutes an emergency in the United States? Like, what does it take to actually pause, stop what we're doing and say, this is unacceptable? Evidently not a pandemic that kills a million people here and many people around the world. Life has gone on, you know, as long as people keep buying and spending and going to work, then everything is fine, right? Um, California and uh, at this point, other parts of this country catch on fire every year. And we know it, we know it's going to happen and we know that next year will be worse. And yet life seems to go on. So I've been wondering, what does it take <laughs> to actually just stop and, and say, we need, we need to disrupt uh, actually business as usual. And then I look at this footage from 40 years ago, a time when people said, this threat of nuclear violence is unacceptable. We will stop what we're doing. We will leave our, our daily lives um, uh, you know, on, on this day and we will mobilize to New York City. We will demand something different and we will shake up business as usual for our communities and actually for the people uh, who, who run this country. And guess what? It actually had an impact. And I think that that's really quite incredible. So I, I, with that, I don't just want to talk about the past. Let me say a word um, about the, the present, because I think, I think the question is, how do we integrate these lessons? I think um, we need quite desperately, how do we integrate them with this moment that we're in now? One thing that I'll say that I think has been an exception to uh, the notion of, of kind of, you know, hoping for the best <laughs> has been the movement for black lives. I mean, I think if any good thing, any progressive thing that we have gotten the past few years has come through mass mobilization, particularly a couple of years ago in 2020, these black led revolts all across this country that forced a different conversation uh, in this country that forced a reckoning with the racist history of this country and the racist present of this country. That finally took down Confederate statues uh, that folks have been fighting uh, to take down for years and years and years. Um, and so, uh, you know, David uh, Swanson said it and Leslie Kagan said it and others have said it today that nuclear weaponry also is an expression of white supremacy, right? It, it, it actually is unsurprising that the same people who structured an architecture, a white supremacist architecture to keep themselves in power in this country through violence also built a white supremacist architecture globally to maintain power, okay? I know there's a lot to unpack there, we should flesh it out, but let's understand that there is some convergence there. The other thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this point, is this incredible gun violence that we are seeing. Um, I mean, wh wh what, what does it say if not the fact that the country that has made itself the center of building lethal weapons, weapons as lethal as possible, right? A reality that has primarily impacted people elsewhere around the world, we are now seeing in an excruciating way here domestically. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a conversation and some convergence to be had there. We're talking about abolishing nuclear weapons as well. So I think the challenge for us today is to integrate these lessons of the past and thank goodness for all of you who lived this history um, with uh, folks who are active today and should be active today and also with an eye to the present or to the, to the future rather, because it's not only about what we're doing today, but what are we saying and what are we doing for the folks who are 10 and 12 today so that when they are 16, 18, 20, they can in their communities take action and uproot the production of these weapons. Um, and shift this whole situation once and for all. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very well said. Uh, thank you for tossing out your speech. It couldn't have been uh, better than that one. Uh, we have uh, some more wonderful speakers, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, 
a, a video from India Walton, who is a nurse, a union representative, the former Democratic nominee for mayor of Buffalo, New York, and currently senior strategic organizer for RootsAction.org. India sent in a short video. We'll play it now about her work dealing with gun violence, police violence, and the interconnections with militarism and nuclear weapons. Good evening, everyone. My name is India Walton. I am a strategic organizer with Roots Action. I am so happy to be here with you today. Um, I'm happy that we are gathered together to commemorate the 40th anniversary of one of the largest anti-war and anti-nuclear arms protests in the history of the United States and possibly the world. But as the former Democratic nominee for mayor of the city of Buffalo, I am also disheartened and discouraged at the direction this nation is taking. It seems as if just within the last two weeks, we've experienced a mass shooting every single day. And as we look to the past, as we look to the activism of so many anti-war demonstrations and protesters and activists who have set the stage for young people and people like me to flourish, to fight for peace in our cities, in our states, and in our country. I want to remind us all that that fight has not yet been won. There's no reason for any individual to own an AR-15. Raising the age to 21 is not enough. We need to ban assault rifles in the United States and really take a move toward disarming our police force and having a society where we are using restorative practices and relationship building in order to solve our problems and not relying on violence. So as we take this time to think about 40 years ago, about June 12th, 1982, let's also think about June 12th, 2022, and how we are going to be activated and adamant in our demands that we demilitarize the police forces in this country, how we ban assault rifles, and how we really take care of one another, bringing to the forefront conversations about white supremacy, about state-sanctioned violence, and about how we really lean into our values of care, culture, and cooperation. Thank you. Emma Claire, is a, Emma Claire Foley is a member of research and policy team at Global Zero. She graduated with a master's degree from Harvard's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies in May 2018. Her research and her interest in disarmament and nonproliferation stems from her years of living and working in Ukraine, where she became interested in her connections between environmental con conservation and nuclear secrecy. In her research writing and translation work, her attempt to bring experience, the experience of the American and post-Soviet nuclear aftermath of the Cold War into conversation as a way of contributing to a global vision of a livable future. Emma Claire, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, what an incredible list of hard acts to follow. <laughs> I, I am um, probably going to take a little bit of inspiration from Corey and not give the exact speech I was planning on because I think most of my notes have been hit. Uh, but instead, I'm going to try to uh, just comment a little bit, maybe draw out a few of the things I've heard that um, you know have been really inspiring so far on this call and uh, talk a little bit about um, my own work and uh, how um, it might uh, help others who are working on, on this really hard problem of eliminating nuclear weapons and uh, addressing all these other um, big, thorny, existential threats that we've talked about on this call today. Um, I was feeling, as I have been watching this footage of the march, I just overwhelmed um, as someone who lives in New York uh, who goes out on the streets pretty regularly I, as part of marches, I find it almost unimaginable to think that that many people <laughs> came out uh, and to uh, oppose nuclear weapons, no less. Um, I know, you know, it was only 40 years ago, um, but I am one of the uh, people on this call who does not have a personal memory of, of the Cold War. Uh, and um, have heard a lot from people
people in my field uh, in nuclear uh, disarmament policy advocacy work uh, about um, you know a certain ambivalence about how when the people we are trying to organize to um, get rid of nuclear weapons to change nuclear weapons policy uh, have this visceral personal memory of uh, doing duck and cover drills for example uh, or um, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis or, or any of these high points where the public really became acutely aware of nuclear weapons, um, it became that much easier uh, to take that memory, that experience, and translate it into a real appetite for action um, and a real sense of the urgency of change. Um, I think, you know, now I, I entered this field in 2017 uh, when um, uh, President Trump and Kim Jong Un were trading uh, threats over of, of you know using nuclear weapons uh, over that summer um, and kind of since then it's there have been several moments I think we all remember of this acute aware public awareness of and sense of vulnerability around nuclear weapons um, we're in one right now uh, with Ukraine uh, with the the what feels like a very real potential of a uh, an accidental use of a nuclear weapon during this time of heightened tensions and limited communication between the two uh, largest nuclear powers in the world, the US and Russia. Um, and so I think that I, we in, in this field and we working against nuclear weapons, I have come to you know, a pretty nuanced understanding of these moments as um, crises that must be avoided, of course, but also uh, moments when we can bring people into uh, the struggle to eliminate nuclear weapons and the struggle to make nuclear war less likely. Um, but it's much harder than that, of course, uh, as I think we all know. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people on this call have explained uh, very eloquently why that is. Uh, the many other crises facing um, this country and the, the fact that, you know, we're watching and experiencing a situation where more and more people, you know, um, are, are unable to meet their basic needs, uh, are, uh, you know, overtaken by this wave of violence that seems to uh, be the real and, and logical outcome of a society organized um, so that a few can enrich themselves by selling weapons of war, no matter what the cost is to anyone else. Um, and all this is happening while, you know, at the same time, it seems like the tools to address it become um, harder and harder to find and, and harder and harder to use. Um, but at the same time, I would say, uh, you know, as someone who works against uh, nuclear weapons and as a, a healthcare organizer as well in my in my off hours, um, that we've seen in, you know, not not too long ago, very recently, some of the strongest and uh, broadest based movements for real profound political change uh, that would disrupt the profound injustices of our current system that we've all been talking about here tonight. Um, I think that, you know, as, as organizers, as advocates uh, for uh, ending the threat of nuclear weapons, um, it is a challenge that we all understand very well to understand or rather to articulate the connections between all of these struggles and um, this struggle to pre prevent um, the use of a nuclear weapon, right? The sort of um, the worst case in which all these other things we're fighting for become sort of immaterial if everything is suddenly destroyed. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I will talk a little bit about my own work at working against uh, the ICBMs, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Force in the U.S. and the replacement program, the ground-based strategic deterrent. Um, again, when I'm looking at the videos of the freeze, I'm thinking about how, you know, elsewhere outside of New York City, uh, the um, in the 80s, you were seeing silo actions in the states where these missiles are based in Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Colorado, um, you were seeing uh, resistance from these communities that today are considered in this very, um, or sort of dismissed as, um, you know, always going to be in support of uh, the nuclear mission that they've been tasked with, the, you know, the burden and the, what 
what has been portrayed by the industry and by representatives, the privilege of living in the shadow of, of uh, ICBM silos. Um, my, my own work in trying to understand the way that the defense industry has sold to um, communities in those states and communities across the country, this idea that their products uh, and their presence uh, is economically indispensable uh, for community support, right? That it's kind of the one way that the U.S. does economic development is through defense spending. Um, it has shown how uh, even though what you hear in um, messaging from companies like Northrop Grumman, which is handling the GBSD program um, in, in others, uh, that you know they exist in this uh, state of cooperation with these companies. In fact, when you talk to people who across the country who have been agitating for organizing for um, preventing the expansion of uh, uh, defense company facilities in their in their towns and cities, in their uh, counties, in their states, um, that the means by which these uh, projects are approved and and put forward the means by which on the ground in the United States uh, the defense industry expands its economic role are profoundly undemocratic at every level of government. Um, and so I want to echo a point that I've heard from many panelists uh, tonight, really rightly so, of the absolute importance of local and state level organizing. Um, and for really understanding the struggle to end nuclear weapons as um, a series of conversations that you're having with your neighbors, with your coworkers. Uh, with your friends, with your family, um, to uh, help each other understand the situation, to help each other understand how these big, broad, sort of unmanageable feeling uh, elements of the world, of, of, the, of the economy, of, of global politics, uh, are really manifest in the places where we live, um, and how we can come to <clears throat> resist them in those places as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm inspired by the history of the Seneca Women's Peace Encampment, um, by the profound awareness from earlier movements against nuclear weapons, uh, that um, you know, sticking close to uh, the place, these places in in your own communities that are where uh, nuclear weapons are held and maintained or built or or you know, researched or whatever, um, is a way to kind of open this up. You know, open up this profoundly undemocratic, this profoundly untransparent. Uh, industry, part of our politics, uh, to uh, public awareness and to public action. Um, and our job is to return to these connections and to deepen our own awareness and the awareness of those we live and work with um, of how the defense industry has ins insinuated itself into American society at that community level. Um, I want to talk. A t I'm going to talk a tiny bit about climate change uh, and the 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 connection between eliminating nuclear weapons and climate change, um, because I think this is something that we've, a lot of us have mentioned, and um, there are a lot of intuitive connections, but the, the, the real um, movement connections and the real sense of, of how to address both of these very urgent existential threats at once um, is still being built. Um, they, as I said, you know, they have a lot of, in common, um, you know, the early understanding of what climate change looked like was drawn from models of nuclear winter. Um, we know that both of these, these ideas, these threats are sort of unthinkable in scope um, and feel very far beyond the control of individuals, whatever people will tell you about how individual action can somehow, uh, is somehow to blame rather than, you know, corporate action or, or government irresponsibility or the things that we really know are causing climate change and are causing a, a lack of action on eliminating nuclear weapons. Um, and we know that both require massive collective action to pr pr prompt a deep change in global politics where we shift from um, this competition, this new enth new newly enthusiastic commitment to arms racing um, towards a, comp a, co a collaboration on these threats that's mutually beneficial, um, that allows us to uh, address a threat that no matter what uh, our, our is happening in our politics, uh, it does affect us all to some degree. Um, all of this is to say that um, the challenges to organizing around both of these are very real, but in both cases, I would say that these local um, community-based efforts, which then you know, form a network to this, these national, these state-level uh, campaigns, which are rooted in sometimes in electoral campaigns, sometimes in 
um, a more uh, a different mix of, of um, approaches are is is really essential, and it's really I think the key to disrupting what feels like a few unbridgeable gaps uh, in American politics today. Um, I think uh, as a movement to eliminate nuclear weapons, um, as we try to build connection stronger connections with other movements, um, we need to focus on. Uh, you know how to how how what we're doing in our own homes and our own hounds and our own cities um, to address this threat. Um, I have more that I could say. I would. <laughs> um, I sort of wish I'd been able to rewrite my whole speech, but I just you know wanted to add a few thoughts. Uh, and I just want to say that I'm really inspired by all of you on this call today. I'm really inspired that there are almost 300 people still on this call after two and a half hours. I uh, and I'm really excited to work with you all to build a better future. The same from everyone else. Back to you. Very well said. Uh, I now get to introduce Anne Wright. Uh, Anne is a retired U.S. Army colonel and retired U.S. State Department official known for her outspoken opposition to the Iraq War. She received the State Department Award for Heroism in 1997, is one of only three State Department officials to publicly resign in direct protest of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. In 2017, Anne Wright was awarded the U.S. Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, for courageous anti-war activism, inspirational peace leadership, and selfless citizen diplomacy. She is the co-author of Dissent, Voices of Conscience, which includes a foreword by Dan Ellsberg. Anne Wright. Well, thank you very much, David. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. What a wonderful group of speakers. And as Dan mentioned, uh, where he was in 1982, he was in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Well, I was um, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, because I was still in the old army then. Uh, I wanted to talk today, and Bill, if you could go ahead and put up this uh, little uh, visual that we have. Uh, I live in Hawaii right now, and uh, four and a half years ago, the citizens of Hawaii were met with a chilling, chilling message on their cell phones. It was emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. And if you think about all of the films that we've seen today, all of the films about the horrors of nuclear weapons, uh, you've seen uh, what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki where nuclear weapons were used on those, those cities. And if you think back to World War II and all of the cities in Europe and, and Japan and Korea that were destroyed. And if you look now at Ukraine and you think of what we see in the papers every day about the level of destruction, the effects of bombing, the effects of nuclear weapons, if they are ever used. And you know, this uh, nuclear alert that we had here, that was back in uh, uh, 19, uh, pardon me, 2018. And that was right at the height of Donald Trump calling Kim Jong-un of North Korea, little rocket man, and, you know, the trading back and forth of threats that uh, North Korea was firing missiles, and they still are. Uh, uh, the whole issue of uh, the, the possibility of the mistakes that could happen uh, where you have alerts that are going off. Uh, someone mentioned, well, I, could, I don't even know that there were there are bomb shelters. I've never seen them. Well, here in Hawaii, when people were faced with the end of their lives and they were trying to use their cell phones to call their families, to call their families to say, it looks like this is the end. Uh, and I'm going to try to get to a tunnel. I'm going to try to get to a cave. I'm going to try to get in a basement. I'm going to try to get down in a manhole cover. I mean, these were the realities of what people are dealing with or dealt with when, when the threat of an incoming missile that could have been by mistake, this, this mistake was at the hands of the emergency center here in Hawaii. It was a it was a mistake. Thank God there wasn't a missile attached to it. But what it what would have happened uh, should the first alert, you know, 
gone out and other countries start responding. And I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to show you uh, and remind you what will happen. Here in Hawaii, we're the headquarters of the Indo-Pacific Command, the military command that uh, has half of the world under its military command. Honolulu, which you'll see out here, Honolulu, if it, it is a target of other countries. This is one of the targets. And if you look back this way, you'll see back there the international airport. And then if you could, you'd see the entrance to Pearl Harbor, which will be one of the major targets of any, quote, enemy forces. Uh, if you look out into the water there, uh, starting on June 29th is going to be the largest naval exercise in the history of the world. It's held every two years. It's called Rim of the Pacific. This year we'll be having 26 countries participating in it. We'll be having 38 ships. We'll have four submarines, 170 aircraft. Uh, many of the submarines uh, that they won't be talking about that are lurking out there in the Pacific are nuclear submarines and nuclear, have nuclear weapons on them, ballistic missiles. Each, each of those ballistic submarines that we have has 20 missiles, each with multiple warheads on it. So just take a look at this city. This will be one of the cities that will not exist anymore if there is a nuclear war. This city right here will be gone just as the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were gone. So these are the things that I think we, we have to portray to our, our friends and neighbors. Have them look around and see what they would like to have uh, in their city. You know, New York City will be gone. Washington, D.C. will be gone. Los Angeles, all the major cities are already targeted, just as we, the United States, have targeted all the cities, all the cities in China, all the cities in Russia. So it's uh, very important that we, we encourage people to really think about what the results, what the effects of a nuclear war would be, and to bring it home to them right in their own homes. So with that, I say we must keep working hard, that it really is our lives that are at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Wonderful. As always, great camera work there. I get to introduce Norman Solomon now. Norman Solomon is the National Director of RootsAction.org. He's the author of a dozen books, including War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death. He was a Bernie Sanders delegate from California to the 2016 and 2020 National Democratic National Conventions. He is also the founder and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy. Norman. Thanks to everybody who made this possible, this live stream. Um, as we wrap up, I wanna briefly talk about moving forward. Uh, one of the real strengths I think of the last few hours has been to focus on history that's largely denied to us by schools and mass media and what passes for political discourse and also to see that it's so essential to create future, so to speak, to create history by what we do now. Um, so I'm gonna talk for just a couple minutes about plans to take action around diffusing nuclear war. There are more than 90 different organizations who have co-sponsored our live stream this afternoon. And everybody who's listened to us in the last couple of hours is on our email list because you've signed up through Zoom. You're gonna hear from us again and again uh, with links that were put in the chat, with resources and with information about upcoming actions. We're definitely into continuing public education and we're also into recognizing that we need to challenge directly the power structure, always nonviolently and always emphatically. And so coming up in the weeks ahead, there will be collaboration among the 90 co-sponsoring organizations to look at how we can mobilize in congressional districts around the country, not only online, but on the ground. Everybody who's making decisions on Capitol Hill has district offices. There are elections coming up. There is a sensitivity to public image. 
we have an incredible silence. It's like the emperor's new clothes. We have an incredible silence where President Biden, whether it was in the State of the Union address or till this moment, has not publicly mentioned the threats of nuclear war, what nuclear weapons are, the heightened dangers from the Ukraine conflict, and the silence on Capitol Hill is almost as uniform. We need to shatter that silence and we're gonna do it through organizing. So that's what DefuseNuclearWar.org is about. That's gonna be a resource you're gonna hear from us because us is us and we're gonna make this happen. With that, I wanna turn our last few moments over back to Anya, who has done such a great job along with everybody else we've heard. And Anya, thanks uh, for everything you've been doing and please uh, give us uh, our, for now, uh, goodbye. Well, this isn't really a goodbye. This is just a beginning, Norman. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, um, as someone who lived through uh, a war, I want to say thank you for continuing your work in this uh, uh, world to, to ask for peace and justice. Thank you for all the participants who stayed with us for um, almost you know, close to two and a half hours here. Thank you to all the speakers. I just recently shared one of our actions where you would be able to email Congress and White House to demand restraints, diplomacy, and negotiation. Um, and please go ahead and uh, send an email to your representative. Um, and uh, I do want to say that this video will be posted next week on diffusenuclearwar.org along with future actions. Uh, and uh, as Hody mentioned earlier, you don't hope for the best, you work for the best. So I look forward to continuing this movement with you in solidarity. Our great speakers, we're gonna save the chat. So if you have your Twitter handles, please drop them in the chat for people to follow you for any more information that you wanna share uh, with our audience. And uh, I bid you farewell for now. Thank you.